rest in our whole service today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, real quick review. 2 Corinthians 2, starting in verse 10. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. The whole, my whole thinking with this series is, I don't want to glorify the devil. I don't want to spook you out with creepy stories. I've had some really kind of creepy things happen with, with demons and other stuff, and I'll, I'll share some later on because that's always fun. But my goal is not to creep you out so you go around and you're like, oh my gosh, Satan's everywhere and we gotta watch out and you know, we're gonna, our lives are gonna be destroyed because he's gonna, trying to get us and so we gotta run to God. No, that's not my goal. My goal is I want, I want us to not be ignorant of what he's doing. I want us to have our eyes open to see, okay, this is who the devil is. This is how he works. This is what he does. This is what he's doing in the world today. This is how he's affecting me and this is how I can walk in freedom because we, we can't just go through life clueless pretending we don't have an enemy or pretending the enemy is a pushover because he's not he is strong he is wise he's been studying us for our whole life long it's, he's he knows how to get us to fail and how to suck the life of God out of us how to, how to trip us up and, and he's he lives to do that and so we need to be smart about it we can't just be overconfident and think oh everything's gonna be fine because then we're gonna fail we're gonna fall down um, so my goal is to, to talk about who he is and what he's doing to, to give us that, that strength, to, to give us wisdom so we can win the fight. Uh, last week I talked about seven simple things that you need to know. Number one, we're in a war. Number two, we can't get out of it. Number three, it's a spiritual war, not a physical war. Four, our enemy is Satan and his demons. It's not Democrats, it's not Republicans. If you don't like Republicans, I think we're pretty Republican here. But uh, it's not a political party. It's not a politician. It's not, it's not terrorists. It's not Muslims. It's not gays. It's not transgenders. It's not no person. It's not your crabby wife that, 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 that got mad at you for no reason in the morning. It's not, yes, last week, Jesse was really mad at me for beating her in star rounds. <laughs> <laughs> So that I made it up. I told her, go, go get a Chinese buffet then. If you're mad at me, go get Chinese food. Leave me alone. <laughs> I beat her in this. I really whomped her in the car game. But I wasn't the enemy. It's Satan. He's the enemy. Um, the enemy is not a person. He's the devil. So the enemy is our enemy, as John Wimber says it. Um, okay, uh, number five, Satan wants to destroy us. He lives to tear you down, to steal, steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to send you sickness, sin. He wants to get you addicted. He wants to torment you with nightmares. He wants to keep you up at night so you can't sleep, give you fear, confusion. That's what he loves to do, to destroy your life. Number six, we need to get serious about fighting. He's not going to... You know, sometimes we have this weird, weird thinking that, okay, I'm a Christian now, now the devil leaves me alone. No, he doesn't. You're a Christian now, now he attacks even more because now you're a threat to him. When you were serving him, yeah, he would attack you and he'd have his fun messing up your life, but when you turn to God, now you're fighting actively in his enemy's camp. You're with God now, and so the war just intensifies. So we, we got to be serious about fighting. Number seven, trust that we can trust that Jesus already won the war. Victory is ours. We don't have to be afraid. Jesus won. All right, that's the review. Boom, got it done. Um, let me share a little story from the Korean War. When, when the U.S. was in the Korean War, kind of, uh, I think it was a year or two into it, I, I should have looked up the dates, but we were in the middle of the Korean War. Um, there were some different opinions about how to fight the war. Uh, General Douglas MacArthur, his idea what he saw going on, he said, okay, we have this war in Korea, and there's China right next door. And so he said, we got to amplify the war in Korea by actually invading China, bring the war to China, and take out communist China. Um, uh, Omar Bradley, another general, um, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they didn't agree with that. They were looking at the war, and they said, all right, we got this war with Korea. Yeah, there's communist China. But we, communist China is not really the problem. The real problem is Soviet Russia that's feeding into communist China and causing these wars all over the place. And so they're thinking, the Joint Chiefs of Staff and Omar Bradley really like hit the message home, was their thinking was the real war was in Russia. Um, these two kind of battled it back and forth for a while. Eventually, Harry Truman, the president, dismissed General MacArthur because he agreed with the Joint Chiefs of Staff and uh, Omar Bradley. And then they did a congressional hearing, May 1951, to figure out, okay, what exactly happened? Was it right to dismiss MacArthur? Because he was kind of a celebrity general. Everybody loved him because he was famous from World War II. Um, and so they did a congressional hearing to find out, was this the right, the appropriate response to dismiss him? In the hearing, Omar Bradley, he says, 
Red China is not the powerful nation seeking to dominate the world. Frankly, in the opinion of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, this strategy invading China, um, this strategy would involve us in the wrong war, at the wrong place, at the wrong time, and with the wrong enemy. You know, historians can debate and discuss, was MacArthur right, and maybe we should have invaded China? Was Bradley right, and it was good that we didn't invade China and we focused on just Korea and then trying to stop things that the Soviet Union was doing? Historians can debate that, but the fact, the truth of that is, the truth that we can find there is we gotta know the war that we're in. We got to, so that we fight the right war at the right place in the right time against the right enemy, not get messed up, mixed up in these wars, these battles around us that aren't really the issue. And so many of us, so many times we get focused on things that are not the main issue. We get all worked up about something going on in our lives. Oh man, there's a problem at work. And like that becomes our main issue. We're, Man, my wife's mad at me, or my husband's mad at me, or my kids are just being rebellious, or my parents don't let me do this. And we think that's the big issue. That's not really the war. Or, or we look at like political things, or, or even like wars um, against terrorism, and war, civil wars going on, war in Syria. And we look at that, and we're like, man, we get all like hung up on that thing. Or we look at problems like sex trafficking, prostitution, homelessness, um, racism, stuff like that, and we go, oh, well, there's this war, we gotta fight this, we gotta solve this. That's not really the right war. The right war is a war be between us and the enemy. It's a spiritual war. And so we gotta make sure we're in the right war, fighting the right war against the right enemy in the right place at the right time. So today I've got four questions to look at regarding our enemy so that, the questions that we need to ask before we go to war. Uh, the first one is, where's the battle? An important question. Uh, the second one, who is our enemy? Third one, what, what do our enemy's forces look like? And four, what are, what are our chances of success? So number one, where is the battle? You know, that's kind of important. You don't want to uh, accidentally invade Omaha, Nebraska when you're supposed to invade Omaha Beach. <laughs> There's a difference. So you want to make sure you know where the battle is, right? Um, Second Corinthians 11.3, Paul gives us a clue to where the where the battle is. Uh, but I am afraid that as a serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. How did the enemy win in, the war with, in his war with Adam and Eve? He got into her mind. He got into her thoughts. And this is pri the primary battlefield that we're dealing with. It's in our minds. We're not, when we talk about spiritual warfare, it's not that we go on some weird new age cosmic psychic plane and we like zoop around and like have our like I don't know psychic sword and we battle like some comic book or something no it's a battle in our minds that we get our minds thinking right we get our minds thinking like the scriptures and when the enemy comes with his deception and his lies that we say no that doesn't go according to what the scriptures say that's that's the primary battlefield that we're dealing with if Eve had never allowed Satan to get into her mind she would have won that war as soon as the serpent comes up and says, well, did God really say? And she goes, ah, yeah, actually, well, here's what he said, and I'm sticking to that so you can get out of here. If she would have just stuck with that one in her mind, she, she would have won the war. That doesn't mean okay, the, the battle is it's primarily, in our, primarily in our minds, that we have to train our minds to think like the scriptures. We have to train our minds to resist lies and to walk in the truth. That, that doesn't mean that that's the only place where the battle is fought because... We're, we're body, soul, and spirit. We're all, and those are all connected. Uh, a battle in our minds can affect our bodies. Um, a battle in our minds can affect our emotions, our wills, ev everything. We're all a united whole, but the primary place where we're going to fight this battle is in our minds. It's in our thinking. Second Corinthians chapter 10, in verse 3, Paul writes, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Again, it comes back to the mind, it comes back to the thoughts. Uh, lofty opinions, knowledge, arguments, taking thoughts captive, it's all in the mind. That's where the battle is primarily fought. But like I said, it's not, because the battle is primarily fought there, it doesn't mean that that's the only place it's fought and it doesn't mean that that won't affect other things. If you think about well, if the enemy can get in your mind, that can affect your body. Like, for instance, if you're driving along, driving along late at night, um, and all of a sudden there's a lot of fog or something, and, and it gets dark, it gets kind of scary, and, and like this, this, the, a demon could come along and just whisper some fear. You know, like, oh man, you got to watch out. And yeah, it's good to be smart. You don't want to drive like 
reckless in the fog. So you slow down and be smart, but then, but there's a difference between being smart and listening to a spirit of fear. And so you're driving along, it gets foggy, it's dark, and you, you, all of a sudden, you know, a demon comes along and whispers some fearful thoughts in your mind. You start thinking about, oh my gosh, we could crash, I can't do this, and you start like shaking a little bit, and then you're sweating, and then, and then you gotta pull over, because like, I just can't handle this. That's, that's the devil coming into your mind, demons coming into your mind, you're not winning the war in your mind, and so then it affects your body, and then it affects your actions, and then it affects your words. You turn to your spouse, you go, I can't handle this. We're just going to crash. We've got to sit here for a while. We've got to wait till sunrise. That's, you know, the, the war is, it begins in our minds. That's the primary place that we're going to fight this battle is in our minds, getting our thoughts fixed on the scriptures. All right, let's do it. I'm going to do a little survey just to drive it home that, that the war is in our minds. Um, okay, how many of you, as you've been driving, have you ever had the thought, oh, just swerving to oncoming traffic, just raise your hand. I'm not riding with you guys. <laughs> Don't ride with me, I thought that too. Or, or go, my, my normal one is go off the embankment. You know, I'm driving, I'm like, then I, I, start, I, think, I start thinking, oh, I could just swerve off the embankment, and then I, I, I have pictures of, uh, what was that, um, the Blues Brothers where they're like zipping along in Chicago, going off the highway, and I'm like, oh, that'd be so fun. No. <laughs> okay, those thoughts, going to oncoming traffic, swerve off the embankment, where do those thoughts come from? Is that from you? No, you want to live. You want to have a good life. You don't want to be in a hospital. You don't want to break your car. Uh, you, you want a nice, peaceful, good life where you're blessed and taken care of, have enough food and have enough money and everything's okay. So it doesn't come from you. Does that, does that come from God? Is God like, you know what? I just want to bless you with this crazy thought right now. No, that's not God. God does not want you to swerve into oncoming traffic. He doesn't want you to go off the embankment. So where does that come from? It comes from demons. It comes from the spiritual war that's going on. It's based, the primary battlefield is in our minds. All right, here's another one. Have you ever been on the edge of a cliff and you've thought, the thought comes to your mind, I should just jump off. Raise your hand if you ever felt like that. A few of you. That one gets me a lot. I, I, I kind of like it. <laughs> I'm like, all I stand at the edge of a cliff. I could just jump off. Yeah, we're watching Heroes right now. We're catching up on our TV, and these guys are jumping off cliffs, and they're flying. I'm like, maybe I'm like that. Maybe I got some genetic marker that allows me to fly when I jump off. No, I don't have that. Um, where does that come from? That comes from the devil. It comes from demons. He, he, he even did that to Jesus. He's got him at the top of the, the pinnacle of the temple, and he goes, why don't you just jump off of that? Jesus is smart enough to say, uh, no, that's not a good plan. Go away, Satan. So this, the war is fought in our minds. Uh, when I was a kid, I remember seeing a, uh, well, and I'll get this a lot too, I'll see fire and I want to touch the fire. And I, I know I'm smart enough to know don't touch fire, fire is hot. But when I was a kid, I was probably uh, 10 or 11 years old, there was a candle in the living room and I remember seeing that and I was like, I gotta burn something. <laughs> my, my mom was there, my sister was there, my brothers were there and I just had this thought, I gotta burn something, I gotta put something in the, burn something with that candle. And so I grabbed a tissue that was nearby and I just kind of put it over the candle and whoosh. And then I'm like, oh crap, threw it on the ground. And now there's a black spot in the carpet right there because of me. And um, like, where did that thought come from? That, it wasn't God saying, you know what? I think your mom would be really blessed <laughs> if you light a tissue on fire. No, that was the devil. And I didn't have the discernment to go, no devil, that's a dumb idea. I'm going to get in trouble and I don't want to ruin my mom's day. I'm not going to do that. The war, is, it's fought primarily in our minds. What about, how many, have you ever had, you know, a thought, um, like you, you come to church and you're like, man, people don't like me. Or you go to work, you go, man, my coworkers, they're all just out to get me. Or what, my boss just has all these problems with me. Or, or a mom, you think, I'm just not doing enough at home. Or, or, man, my husband doesn't love me because he didn't like my gluten-free brownies and so he wants a divorce. Have you ever had any weird thoughts like that? Yeah, we all get thoughts like that. That's not from God. It's not from you. It's from the devil. And it's sending his demons out to just put these dumb thoughts in your head that aren't true because he, wants, he knows if he can get you thinking his thoughts, then you start thinking that way and you don't even realize it's him. You think it's you. You think that you're mad at yourself or that you're you're so observant and you see these things going on or you're just stupid and so you he says his thoughts they get in your mind and you take them as your own and then you start you actually do start to think like he thinks and then you start to talk like he talks and and act like he acts but it all starts with your mind so we the war the primary battlefield it's in our minds and so that's why 
You know, that's why it's so important to get in the scriptures, spend time with God, and to renew your mind in the Word of God. I'm going to talk a lot more about this in the coming weeks. Um, at least have like one whole message just about like winning the war in our minds. But just that's enough for now. That we got to know the battlefield, the primary battlefield, it's in our minds. It's not so, on some weird psychic realm somewhere that, that you fly along with your, your new age powers. It's in your mind, training your mind to see things as God sees them. All right, number two, who is our enemy? Well, we talked about this already, that the enemy is Satan. Um, but let's look a little bit more. I want to look a little more into his history, where he comes from, what he's been doing, where he's headed. Because for me, I don't know if any of you are bothered by this, but I was really bothered by this for a number of years. I, you know, I, I think about, okay, God is all-powerful, and he's good. So why do we have Satan? <laughs> it really bothered me, because I'm like, God is good. And God, if God could do anything he wants... Why does he let Satan be here? Why, why, are the, why, why, are, why do we have demons? Why do we have temptations? Why, should we live, why do we have to live in a world where, where you drive along and you have to not swerve into on, or it's a temptation to swerve into oncoming traffic? Why do, why do we have to deal with this stuff? Well, God did not create, well, God, some religions teach that, that we live in a, wor, a dualistic world where you've got an all-powerful, well, a half-powerful good God, and you have a half-powerful evil God, and the two are fighting back and forth, but they're basically equal. Well, that's not what the Bible says. Um, uh, the Bible is very clear that Satan is a created being, but he wasn't created evil. Now, let's look at his origin a little bit. It's kind of mysterious, kind of... Metaf there's a lot of uh, scriptures that have metaphors that you kind of got to piece together. The Bible never really comes out and says, look, here's the autobiography that Satan wrote, talking about where his birthplace and all this stuff. It's not real clear, so you kind of got to take from here and there and extrapolate things and go, okay, I think this is what is being said here. So if you're very left brain, you might be like, mm, I don't know about all that. If you're right brain, then you're all good with it, so it's good. Mm. Ezekiel 28. Uh, starting in verse 12. Son of man, raise up a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God. All right, just to pause there quick. So this is a prophecy that it says it's for the king of Tyre, an actual man who lived back, back when Ezekiel was prophesying. But, so why, why do I say that? Why am I using this to talk about who is Satan? Well, because when you look into the verses, it becomes pretty clear this is not about an actual physical king, the descriptions of his activities and what he does and where he comes from, it's like, this has to be someone different, some, a supernatural being of evil. And so most scholars look at it and say, yeah, we think that this was actually about Satan, not about the king of Tyre, but that's a metaf it's a metaphor to talk about Satan. Um, you are the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Okay, so who was in Eden? And this is another reason we say that this was probably Satan. Who was in Eden? Well, you had God, you had Adam, you had Eve, and you had the serpent. The king of Tyre, as you see, you'll see in the description, it clearly can't be God. It's not Adam. It's not Eve. Well, who does that leave? That leaves the serpent. That leaves Satan. And so it looks like this is a metaphor to talk about who Satan was. Um, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, sardius, topaz, and diamond. Going through all these precious stones that I don't recognize. And crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. The, the King James and the New King James actually say the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes. Um, so some people believe that Satan was created as the worship leader in heaven. Um, on the day that you were created, they were prepared. And this is important. Satan was created. So there, there was a certain time where God created Satan, not to be Satan, but to be a glorious angel in heaven. Uh, verse 14. You are an anointed guardian cherub. A cherub uh, in the Old Testament, it's uh, when, when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, it says that God placed two cherub, well, cherubim is the plural of cherub. He placed two cherubim to guard the Garden of Eden to make sure that Adam and Eve wouldn't come back in their sinful condition and take from the tree of life. So now they're living forever in their sinful condition. Um, so he guarded, uh, he, he barred Adam and Eve from coming in there. And to, to keep them away, he placed to cherubim right there. And so it says here, you were an anointed guardian cherub. So Satan was created before the fall, before he fell, as some sort of guardian protector angel um, to, take, take, to, to serve God in heaven. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire you walked. 
You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till, un till unrighteousness was found in you. So in the beginning, God created Satan, but he didn't create him to be evil. He didn't create him as the devil, as our adversary. He created him as, as a protector angel, a glorious, beautiful protector angel that maybe was wor leading worship in heaven. He, he had an exalted, uh, majestic status in heaven, not created to be our adversary. Um, some people say that they believe he was maybe one of the, th well, the Bible talks about Michael and Gabriel, the archangels, and they say maybe Satan originally was one of those, and he fell from that position. Um, we don't know exactly, but whatever it was, he was created as to be something, someone good in heaven. Uh, Job 38 even talks about that he was with all the other angels when God created the earth, that he was with all the other angels glorifying, praising God for what he had done in creation. But Satan wasn't content. With that. He wasn't content to lead worship in heaven or to be this exalted, glorious angel. He wanted the place of God. Uh, in verse 16, in the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst and you sinned. That word trade is kind of weird here. Um, it's the word, in, in Hebrew, it's rekula, which uh, it's only ever used in a negative sense in the Bible. I couldn't find anywhere where it's used like, oh yeah, they were just trading some goods, just in, a, in like a uh, I don't know, like a middle of the road sense, um, a neutral sense. It's always in a negative sense. It's never in a positive sense either. Um, it's always used in a negative sense and it's related to words that are translated as to slander, to uh, bear tales. So whatever Satan was doing, it, it translated here trade, it was no good. We don't, I don't know if maybe he was going around campaigning like, hey, vote for me instead of God. I don't know what he was doing, but it wasn't any good. Um, so you were filled with violence in your midst, and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you. So God created him to be this glorious being in heaven, to worship God, to lead things in heaven, to have authority over other angels, to be beautiful and perfect in every way, blameless, and yet he wanted more. Out of pride, he looked and he said, okay, I want God's position. And because of that pride, then God cast him out of heaven. You know, that makes, that, that's, you know, a warning there for us. If, if this angel, this beautiful, amazing, powerful angel could be cast out of heaven because of his pride, man, we got to watch our own hearts that we don't walk in pride. And, you know, this, this isn't very, this is probably not a very popular thing to say, but for we, having lived outside of America and, and experienced other cultures, coming back to America, Americans are pro, pro, very prideful. Um, there's a good sense of it where we're proud to be Americans, even ones who say they're not proud to be Americans. It's like, you're still proud to be American. They just don't admit it. But having lived outside of America and coming back, it's, it's rare to find people who are really humble in America. Um, and it's not just our sin, it's a human sin, but we gotta be aware of it because that's kind of where our culture goes. And so we gotta be different where we don't give in to pride like the enemy gave in. That's what caused them to get kicked out of heaven. So we can't, we can't walk in that ourselves. Um, all right, verse 18. By the multitude of your iniquities and the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. So I brought fire out from your midst. It consumed you, and I turned you to ashes on the earth in the sight of all who saw you. So, where, so Satan, God created him as this glorious angel and then just cast him out of heaven to the point where it says that he was turned into ashes on the earth in the sight of all who saw you. He got all the glory, all the majesty stripped from him. Revelation 12 gives us another picture of the rebellion and the war that followed. Uh, verse 3, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them on the earth. And so this is where we say that in Satan's rebellion that he took a third of the angels and brought them to his side, and those became the demons that torment us nowadays. Um, and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth. Well, then it just goes through in the next few verses, kind of uh, giving a metaphorical picture of Jesus' birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension to heaven, all the way up to verse 7. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. 
So this war breaks out in heaven, and Michael and his, and his angels are fighting against Satan and all of his, his one-third of the angels that he brought to his side. But he, the, Satan, no matter how much he fought, no matter how hard the war was, they couldn't overtake God. They couldn't win. They were cast out of heaven, thrown to the earth. In Jude 1.6, it says that, the, that God uh, kept them in eternal chains and, under gloomy darkness. I don't think this means that demons don't have any power nowadays. I think, it, I think it's a... When you look at the balance of Scripture, it's very clear that demons still have some power. And I think when you look at like regular life, there would, if demons had no power, there'd be no evil on the planet. But there's plenty of evil. And so what, what I think this means is that essentially demoting Satan and his angels from having this glorious position to now they're thrown down to the earth, it was, it was practically like they're, they're put in chains, that they don't have the power they used to have. They can't just fly around heaven and do whatever they want, and they don't have the authority that they used to have. They don't have the power they used to have, the glory they used to have. Now they're, they're, they're punished to wander on earth, and, and, and they're so, uh, they've been brought to such a low state now that they're... That they, they, they want any bit of glory, and they're willing to infest people, get inside people, so that they have a little bit of glory now, because they've been cast so far down, um, if that makes sense. I, yeah, I don't know. So, I, I, it makes sense to me. <laughs> so, the idea is, they had all this glory. God threw them down. Now, they don't have that glory. They don't have that majesty. They don't have that power, but they're hungry for it, because they used to have it, so they're willing to get into your life and mess with your thoughts, mess with your mind, mess with your life, really, because they want a taste of that glory again. And we have that glory, because we were created in the image of God. That's what I was trying to say. All right. Uh, all right. So, what, when did this rebellion occur? Um, this is something kind of interesting that I was studying about, and it's not real clear exactly when Satan took these angels and led the rebellion against God and was cast down. We're not exactly sure when it happened, but there's a couple things we do know. Um, so it had to happen after God started creating, because Satan had to be created, so you know he can't rebel if he's not created. Makes sense. Um, and it had to happen sometime before he tempted Adam and Eve, because he had to be evil by the time. Um, by the time that happened. So Derek Prince, a uh, Bible teacher from Britain, has had this interesting theory that it happened somewhere between Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and verse 2. That somewhere in there was the Great Rebellion. Let me read Genesis 1, 1. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then 2, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. That phrase, without form and void, it's a uh, Hebrew phrase, tohu vabohu. And uh, it's kind of cool to say, tohu vabohu. <laughs> it basically means screwed up, messed up, snafu, fubar, whatever you want to say. That's the, uh, you know, the scholarly <laughs> words there. Um, the Romanian had a word, uh, a phrase for it that came from Turkish um, that kind of is similar. Yeah, Jesse knows it. Uh, harababura. You go into a room, you go into a house, and it's like, the, well, you left your kids there, and they've thrown things everywhere, and you go in, and you're like, oh my gosh, it's harababura right now. Like, things are just crazy. That's kind of what, what this tohu vabohu is a little bit like. Um, that it was messed up. Um, the only times you see this, th this phrase in the Old Testament is in response to God's judgment. When there's a land or people that are doing evil and God judges them, and it says that they become tohu vabohu, that he just lays it waste. It's like a post-apocalyptic wasteland now, completely destroyed. And so, 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 so it's interesting. Genesis 2 then, when it says it was formless and without void, it was this state that we only see being applied to a place that was judged by God. And now, here's kind of something kind of weird. Isaiah 45, verse 18, um, Isaiah says that God did not create the earth Tohu, void, but that he created it populated, or uh, he cre I don't remember populated exactly, but he says he does not create it, he did not create it void, tohu. And so Derek Prince has this theory, and I thought, well, it's kind of interesting, and we can't totally prove it one way or another, but I find it interesting, so I thought I'd share it. Um, that Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 is God creating the earth and everything, and it's beautiful and perfect, because God's awesome, and he's not going to create mistakes, he's going to create stuff perfect. And then Satan rebelled, and then that, and then, 
then God judged Satan and everything that he touched. And that's verse 2 then, where everything's tohu vabohu, it's screwed up, it's messed up, it's post-apocalyptic wasteland. And then you go on to verse 3, and then God starts recreating, reforming things, bringing life to where there was death before. And then he goes further to, now he's creating man, and we, so we were created in direct response to the fact that Satan rebelled and destroyed everything. And so the creation of man was, you're going to take care of this now. Last time I didn't have you here, and it got screwed up, but now you're my representative representative here and you keep this safe, you keep it good, you keep it holy, and you bring my life and my, my dominion here to this planet. Did, is that when it happened or not? We, we don't totally know. I think it's interesting and maybe it does kind of make some things make a little bit more sense in my head, but I don't know. But what we do know is that Satan rebelled and because of that we're living with the effects of it nowadays. All right, so Satan rebelled. He was kicked out of heaven. He came to the earth, and he just continued the war against God on the earth. Genesis 3, he gets into Eve's mind, gets her to sin, gets Adam to sin, and then he gets, continues to spread sin further where Cain uh, murders Abel. And then it goes even further where Lamech, uh, a couple generations later, rises up to boast in his murder. And then it's Genesis 6, where every thought of all the intentions of mankind's heart was only evil continually. So you see Satan, he was kicked out of heaven, and then he just went, okay, well, now I'm, if I can't beat God, if I can't take his throne, I'm going to continue the war on the earth. And that's what he's been doing. All, and things basically continued like that all the way up until Jesus came. When Jesus came, he dealt Satan a, a death blow that he's never been able to recover from. Uh, when Jesus died and rose again on the cross, it says um, in Hebrews 2.14 that he destroyed the one who has the power of death, the devil. Jesus on the cross destroyed the devil, took his power. 1 John 3.8 says that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. So not only, not only was the devil destroyed, but all of his works, all of his effects, all of that stuff, Jesus came on the cross to... to, to decisively defeat the enemy. Colossians 2.15, it says about Jesus, God disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Jesus. The NIV writes, He made a public spectacle of them. Christian Standard Bible says He disgraced them publicly. Contemporary English version says, Christ defeated all powers and forces. He let the whole world see them being led away as prisoners when he celebrated his victory. And the last one, the Weymouth New Testament. I like, I like this one here. And the hostile princes and rulers he shook off from himself and boldly displayed them as his conquests when by the cross he triumphed over them. Satan came and, and waged war against God by destroying creation and by hurting people and spreading sin throughout the planet. But when Jesus came on the cross, he did something dramatic. Things shifted where the enemy was, was given a blow that he's never recovered from. But, now, but that's not it. Now we're promised a future victory that's even greater than what Jesus did in the past. And one day Satan's going to be completely destroyed. Isaiah 14 in verse 3 um, so this is a prophecy against Babylon, but like the verse in Ezekiel, I think it's a metaphor for Satan. Uh, and why, why I say this is, well, there, this one really bothered me for a while. So I had to look into it and go, okay, well, was this really about Satan or is this about the king of Babylon? And I read a lot of people's opinions and I came to the conclusion that I think this is, it is about Satan and here's why. Um, there's, as far as we can tell, there's no Babylonian king that ever totally matches that ever even really very well matches the, the description here. There's one that comes kind of close, but kind of close doesn't cut it. Um, another reason is there's a few statements that are said in the following um, prophecy that are clearly not about an earthly king. And so you think, okay, it's got to be about some supernatural being somehow. Uh, Origen and a lot of the early church fathers believed that this was about Satan. Um, and this was a belief ad adopted very early on in, in the church. And most important, Jesus made a statement in uh, Luke 10, 18 about Satan falling like lightning that seems to be alluding to these verses. And so, so even though these verses, it says it's about the king of Babylon, think in your mind, okay, no, this is about Satan. Um, so verse 3. When the Lord has given you rest from your pain and turmoil and the hard service with which you were made to serve, you will take up his, this taunt against the king of Babylon. How the oppressor has ceased, the insolent fury ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of rulers, that struck the peoples in wrath with unceasing blows, that ruled the nations in anger with unrelenting persecution. 
The whole earth is at rest and quiet. They break forth into singing. So one day, Satan, though he's powerful and though he's laid waste to the nations, one day he will be destroyed and the whole earth will break forth into singing. The cypresses rejoice at you, the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since you were laid low, no woodcutter comes up against us. Sheol beneath is stirred up to meet you when you come. It rouses the shades to greet you. All who were leaders of the earth, it raises from their thrones all who were kings of the nations. All of them will answer and say to you, You too have become as weak as we. You have become like us. Your pomp is brought down to Sheol, the sound of your harps. Maggots are laid as a bed beneath you, and worms are your covers. From the pinnacle of heaven, from having this exalted state where he could command angels, and he was leading worship in heaven, and bedecked with jewels, and from that state of authority and glory, cast down, and now one day he'll be eaten by maggots. That's crazy. Uh, where, where was I here? Okay. Uh, How you are fallen from heaven, O day star. The King James Version says Lucifer. O son of dawn, how you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on a mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Again, just a reminder that his, the original sin of Satan, the original sin to enter creation was pride. This idea that Satan going, I'm going to get that. I will ascend to heaven. I will take the throne of God. I will be, the, be in this exalted state. Pride was the original sin. Um, but you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. Those who see you will stare at you and ponder over you. Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a desert and overthrew its cities, who did not let his prisoners go home? Even Satan, though he's powerful and though he's leading to evil all over the planet and has been doing it for thousands of years, even Satan, one day, Jesus promises, God promises that he will be cast down and have no more power. No, no, he won't be doing anything on the planet. We'll have a new heavens and a new earth that will be completely free from sin, free from every power of the enemy, free from every tampering of the enemy. Revelation 20 gives us another picture of it. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit, and shut it and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that he must be released for a little while. There's different ideas of when this did happen or will happen and what it'll exactly look like. But the, the, uh, the encouragement here is that God is in control. Satan will be bound up. Satan will be defeated. Satan doesn't have authority to do whatever he wants. But in, when, you, when one day all of time and everything is finished and we read the biography of Satan, it ends in his complete destruction and failure. Amen. Then verse 10, And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's the ending of his biography. So this is, this is the enemy from, from birth to end. Um, and so let's look at number three. What do our enemy's forces look like? So if you're going, to, you know, if you're going into a physical war, it's important to know where the battle is. It's also important to know who your enemy is and kind of what his history is and where he's headed and what his plans are and all that. But it's also important to know what exactly are his forces like? What, what do the soldiers look like? How many cannons does he have? How many ships does he have? Um, so what about Satan? Well, one thing is he has a kingdom. Luke chapter 11, verse 17. Uh, Jesus is in the middle of casting out a demon and people come up and criticize him. They say, oh, he's casting out demons by Satan. So Jesus, in verse 17, he says, it says, Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against, uh, divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. So we know that Satan has a kingdom. Just like God has a kingdom where he's in charge, and he's got archangels and angels, and he's got us, and, and we're all moving forward in his kingdom while well, Satan has a counterfeit kingdom. Satan has his, his domain where he's in charge and he has his demons and his arch demons and other beings that he's leading to fight against the kingdom of God. Another thing about Satan and his forces that we need to be aware of is that he's organized. Take a drink. Mm. 
I need to get like one of those, one of those hats with the straws coming down. <laughs> or like a giant gerbil thing here that I could... <laughs> get on that, one of you. Get on that, all right? <laughs> Watch, I'll come in next week. There'll be a big gerbil thing. Like, I wasn't serious. <laughs> okay, Satan's organized. Uh, compared to God, Satan is weak. Satan um, is not omnipotent. He can't be everywhere and do everything. So compared to God, he's a pushover, but he is smart and he is very organized. Um, some, people, some people claim, and I read, I've read some books where people have it all mapped out and they go, okay, this word means, that, this word in the Greek means this kind of a demon and that's what's doing things over here and this word means this kind of a thing in Satan's forces and that's what's doing over I don't think the Bible's that clear. I don't think the Bible has everything all mapped out or if it does, I don't think we totally understand it yet. I know I don't totally understand it, but the Bible is clear that there is a level of organization in Satan's kingdom, that he's organized, he's ordered, he's efficient in doing his work. Um, let's go to Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. So there, there's kind of four, I don't want to call them levels, but four different areas of Satan's kingdom that we see talked about here in Ephesians. First one is rulers. In Greek, it's arche. Um, it means something that comes first and is ahead of or above the rest, something that is preeminent. It's used for, to talk about a ruler or a chief over a tribe. It's where we get, you know, the word archangel would be an angel over other angels. Archbishop, same root there, a bishop over other bishops. Arches, arches go over a doorway or over a hallway, over a room. We have an arch above us right now that's going over us right now. So it's the, this idea of there's a ruler, a, a satanic ruler that's over other demonic beings. Uh, an example in the scriptures would probably be the Prince of Persia or the Prince of Greece that we see talked about in Daniel 10. It seems like, it seems like there's probably some sort of regional, seems like probably, <laughs> it's very authoritative. Um, like I said, a lot of it is you, you can't like make really super clear statements about all this stuff because the Bible doesn't really make super clear statements about all this stuff. But it seems like um, these arche, these rulers, might have some sort of regional influence. Um, it makes sense to me because you think about the different places of the world that struggle with different problems. Like the Middle East, um, there seems to be a ruling spirit of violence, uh, Islam, uh, terrorism probably. Um, in, uh, in America, in Europe, maybe ruling spirits of materialism, of rationalism, of uh, perversion probably, immorality. Um, Romania, sexual immorality was one of the ruling spirits there, for sure. Wisconsin, uh, what, what are ours? Probably drunkenness, maybe sex trafficking, uh, segregation, racism kind of stuff in certain areas like Milwaukee. Um, so I, th I think these are probably regional spirits that have a certain influence in a certain area where the devil in his organization, in his kingdom has said, okay, you, Prince of Persia, you've got power over Persia. Prince of Greece, you've got power over Greece. And um, th wh what they do is, just like God and his forces ha have a certain plan to bring his blessing and his goodness and his healing to the planet, the devil and his forces, their plan, their commission from the devil is to bring his plan and to work against the forces of God. Where, where God wants to bring love, they go, okay, well, we're gonna bring hate. Where God wants to bring prosperity, they say, well, we're gonna bring famine. We're gonna bring poverty. So they have a plan that they're working for in, in Satan's kingdom, and part of that plan is to oppose what God is doing. So that's, that's what I think rulers are. And then we go on to the next one here is authorities. It's the word exousia in Greek, which literally means authority or power. Um, delegated influence. I think this would be demons where the devil, just like we have delegated power from God. Jesus, Jesus has all power and all authority, and he gave us authority. He gave us delegated authority to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to bring the gospel, the good news, bring his kingdom to the planet. So we have that authority delegated to us from God, sent out as his ambassadors, while well, Satan has his demons, certain demons that have his delegated authority to do certain things on the planet. What these are, I don't know. I don't know, but they're there. 
the third section we see here he calls it in the ESV cosmic powers over this present darkness. There's two main Greek words being used here. Um, Cosmocrator and skotos. Skotos is the easy one, it just means darkness. Uh, it could be either physical or moral, but because we're talking about a spiritual war, it's moral, spiritual darkness in this case. And cosmocrator, this is interesting. It comes from two different words, cosmo and krateo. Um, it's translated, it only shows up here in the Bible, and if you look at the strongest concordance and other dictionaries, they say ruler of the world, ruler of this world. But what does that really mean? Well, I, I don't know. But um, if you look at Cosmo and Krateo, where that word comes from, Cosmo, it literally means an ordered system. Um, it's where we get our words co cosmopolitan from, cosmonaut, cosmetology, um, the cosmos. Um, it's any kind of thing that's arranged in an order, in a system. And so w when we talk about the, the cosmos, it's the ordered creation, that God put things all in order. And I think here, it's when, when it talks about cosmocrateo, cosmo, how is it, cosmocrator. <laughs> it's talking about the order in either the order of the cre created order, the world that we see, or it could be the order in Satan's kingdom. And then crateo means to dominate, to rule as a master to place under one's grasp, seize hold of, or put under control. And that word, it was translated that way many times in, in the New Testament. And so these aren't nice rulers, these cosmocrateo, they're not the cosmic powers over this present darkness, they're not nice rulers where the demons voted and they say, hey, yeah, let's get this guy in office. No, these are guys who dominate, who seize control, who seize power, and they use their, their power to bring evil onto the planet, into the created order. All right, the last one. Spiritual forces of evil. In Greek, it's pneumatica ponerias. Um, essentially, evil spirits. There is no forces in the Greek there. You could just as easily say, instead of spiritual forces of evil, you could just as easily say spiritual beings of evil. It says spirits of evil, spiritual things of evil is really what it's saying. And this, this I think, is what we call demons, um, or evil spirits, or unclean spirits. Um, this is, this is where, our, where our battle typically these are the forces that we'll confront. I don't think, I don't think we're going to take down arch demons. I don't think we're ruling spirits over a region. Okay, I think those are ones that are eventually will leave because the gospel goes forward and the demon goes, hmm, okay, I'm finding a new spot. Or Satan goes, all right, the battle's lost. We're going in a new place now. But these, these spiritual forces of evil, these um, evil spirits, these are the ones that we'll confront in our regular life. These are the ones that are putting thoughts in your head to drive into oncoming traffic to put that tissue onto the, onto the candle. Um, thoughts that your husband hates you. Thoughts that everybody's mad at you. Thoughts that, I'm just a loser. I'm never gonna amount to anything. Um, these are the ones that send sickness to your life. Addictions, they try to tempt you to get you into sin. Com these are the ones that, that send controlling compulsive behavior. Uh, there was a guy in our church in Milwaukee that he came to me one time and uh, he said, he's like, Jake, can you pray for me? I think I got, uh, got a head scratching demon. I'm like, a what? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I just keep scratching my head and I can't stop. I'm like, well, I don't know. A lot of people scratch their heads. You, you need to change your shampoo. Or I'm like trying to think of these natural explanations. And he's like, no. I, and then he shows me his head. And he like, parts the hair a little bit. And you can see it's like all raw because he scratches it all the time. I'm like, okay, yeah, that's not normal. Um, let me pray. So we prayed and I cast out a head scratching demon. And then he stopped scratching his head and he was all good. You don't find a head-scratching demon in the Bible, but okay, it seems like that was the case there. And now he's set free and he's all good. But the compulsive behaviors like that, that's not just how you are. And that's not, well, they're just kind of picky and that's just what they do. And, or, well, I was always kind of like this as a kid. Well, it doesn't matter. You could get set free. That's not you. That's a demon manipulating you and using his power to hurt you. So you can get set free from that stuff. All right, so that's, that Satan's kingdom is organized. Um, it's, but typically the ones that we're going to deal with, they're the, you know, the ground level forces, these day-to-day, -day, everyday, average demons that come to harass us and torment us, make us afraid, make us lonely, scared. I guess that's afraid. Um, demons are mentioned in over 100 verses in the New Testament. When I, when I became a Christian, uh, well, I came, come from a very evangelical background where we didn't talk about demons, we didn't really believe that they existed. Um, 
But then as I was reading the Bible, I'm like, oh my gosh, they're everywhere. Jesus is casting out demons all the time. His disciples are casting out demons. The early church is casting out demons. It's like they're showing up all the time, and they're doing crazy stuff. Like Legion had so many demons, had all these demons in them, and they were so strong that he's breaking chains, and he's running through the tombs naked and howling at the moon. And like they're doing crazy stuff in the Bible, and Jesus just comes up and boom, casts them out. Um, so that's the amazing thing we see that, yeah, we're, Satan's powerful, he's got a kingdom, it's organized, and he knows how to fight, um, and yeah, we have to, there's demons all over in the New Testament, a lot of verses about it, but all over, when they talk about demons, what we, what we get again and again is that Jesus beats them. Jesus defeats the demons, and it's not hard for him, it's easy for him, he shows up and boom, they're gone. It's not a battle for him. All right, so let me, let me summarize. Where's the battle? It's in our minds. It's in our thoughts. Who is our enemy? It's Satan and his kingdom. Um, and we, he's not God. He's not a God. He's a created being. And we, we know his past. We know where he's been. We know what he does. And we know that his future is that he's going to be completely destroyed one day. So we don't have to fear him. Uh, and the third question I asked was, what do our enemy's forces look like? Well, they're organized, they're active. It's a kingdom where they're bent to destroy us and hurt us in our regular lives. Let me close with number four then. What are our chances of, of success? You know, Jesus talked about that um, a king, when he's going to war, would be wise to look at his troops and decide, do I have enough to defeat this guy? And so we want to do the same. We want to look at this war. We go, okay, we see Satan's powerful. We see what he does. We see, see his troops and the organization and all that. Do we have enough to defeat this guy? Can we win in this war? Yes, 100%. We can win in the war. Don't worry. Um, why am I so confident? Well, you know, we don't want to treat Satan like he's a joke, but just like look at the facts. Um, first, Satan has lost every major battle. So he must be French. <laughs> he's not German, he's not American, because we win. <laughs> Satan has lost every major battle. You know, I, I think about, there's, two, there's been two major battles for Satan. There was the first great rebellion, uh, where he wants to take over heaven. But what happens? He gets cast out of heaven. He doesn't win that. He lost, and he definitively lost, to the point where now instead of enjoying the luxuries of life and the glories of heaven, now he's, now he's got to infest people on earth and try to work with, with people to build his kingdom on the earth. That, he completely lost that, that battle. Uh, the second battle would be the cross. The best Satan could do was keep Jesus dead for a few days in the grave. But that, that was the best he could do. And Jesus rose up and completely crushed Satan's, Satan's power. He took, disarmed him and paraded him around as a victor. The, the two major battles that he had, he completely lost. And so his history is bad. Okay. Uh, number two, God promises future total victory. We uh, talked about that before. That We know the end. We know that Satan will be com completely crushed. So... So he's not, there's, 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 no, there's no chance that we're going to lose. There's no chance, even in our, our life, if we stick with God, if we are submitted to his word, we keep in his ways, we don't have to worry what Satan's going to do because we're with God and we're guaranteed victory. The third thing is that while Jesus was on the earth, he demonstrated complete authority over demons, complete victory over demons. Wherever he went, he's always casting demons out. Anybody who had any kind of issue any sickness or any demonic problem that came to him, they got healed, they got delivered. He broke the power of the enemy everywhere Jesus went. So, and if Jesus was like that while on the earth, limited to a physical body, dealing with colds and tiredness and hunger and all that, and if he had that level of authority then, how much more does he have now that he's glorified in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father? And not only that, but the last, the last reason we can be confident that that we're going to win in this war is that the early church did the same thing that Jesus did. Jesus was going around laying waste to the enemy's domain, and then he taught his disciples to do the same, and they went out and did that. The book of Acts reads like the Gospels, only now instead of one person, now it's dozens, hundreds of people that are going out, casting out demons, setting people free, healing the sick, bringing the kingdom of God to crush the kingdoms of Satan. Ramsey McMullen, in, in the book Christianizing the Roman Empire, he writes it this way, Jesus' authority over the fiercest infestations of satanic power, making them do whatever he wished by a mere word of command, he passed on to his disciples with instructions to use it. They did. Let me leave it with that. 
Satan is powerful. He's got a kingdom. He's fighting against us. He's vicious. He's evil. But we have victory because Jesus won the victory on the cross. And no demon is stronger than Jesus. And so whatever the enemy is doing in your life, if he's bringing torment, if he's bringing fear, confusion, hopelessness, depression, if he's bringing sin into your life, there's an, an issue that you're just not getting freedom from. You keep getting angry, or you keep looking at porn, or you keep whatever stealing thing, or I don't know, whatever issue it might be that you keep getting into, you can get free from that because Jesus bought freedom for us on the cross, and he defeated the enemy. So we can trust in his freedom for our lives, trust in his victory for our lives. Let me pray. Jesus, thank you for completely destroying the enemy. Thank you that though he's organized and he's got a kingdom and he has a certain level of power and authority that we can trust in your victory and we can trust that in the defeat of Satan that you, you destroyed him on the cross and that one day he will be completely obliterated from all of creation, that he's not going to have any impact in the future. But Lord, thank you that we can step into that now, that as your children, as your Sons and daughters, we can step today into that freedom, into the victory that you promise us. And Father, if there's anybody here that's struggling with anything, if there's anybody that, that is losing the fight, losing the war against demons and against uh, Satan's forces, God, that you would give them victory and that you would give them power and authority to walk in the freedom and the joy and the love that you have for them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.